All right. Um, this week we start into JavaScript, and again, we don't go thoroughly into JavaScript, but we want to give an introduction to you so you understand its role and understand the basics of the workings of JavaScript. Um, when you hear the word script in web programming, I guess I'm not 100% sure why people call it scripting instead of programming. It's essentially the same thing. Um, but there are two sides to scripting. There's client side and server side. We talked about server side in this class, although we did not see any examples of server side coding in this class. Remember when we drew our diagram, we said that the client, who is someone running a browser, makes a request through the internet. That request gets routed to the proper web server. And we talked about static and dynamic pages. In the case of dynamic pages, what you had is you did not have completed web pages on the other end. But you had scripts or programs on the other end. And these scripts or programs are not entirely written in HTML. They contain HTML. But they're written in other languages, such as PHP or Perl or ASP.NET and C Sharp and, and, and Java and any number of different things. All right? And what they do is they take parameters that the client that the user gives them. And in our particular case, we spent a lot of time talking about the forms, how you can send form data. When you type something in, a form, that gets sent to the web server, and the web server uses it to construct your web page. All right? So if you Google something, um, of course, one of the main things that the server uses is what you've typed into the search box of what you're searching for. So. But there's other parameters, too. The kind of computer you're on, um, the, um, the, the, the date and time, um, where you are at in terms of your IP address, which can be used to determine an approximate location of you, and so on. All these are parameters that get sent to the web server. And the web server's programs take this input And make a web page just for you. And I think one of the best examples of that we talked about is when you Google something, if you were to Google restaurants, you'd find restaurants in the area where you were Googling from. So if you're in Lorain County area, you're going to mostly find Lorain County uh, restaurants near the top of the list. All right? So the script knows that you're in Lorain County based on your IP address. It knows that you've asked for, for example, Italian restaurants. It takes those parameters, along with some other things, and comes up with a listing of Italian restaurants just for you. So it's custom made for you. So it's not like there's a bunch of web pages sitting out there already finished. The web page is created on the fly. And if you think about it, it's pretty amazing you know, how quick that happens. And it's, it's a testament to how far this sort of technology came. But it's not done with plain old static HTML. It's done with server-side scripting or server-side programming. All right? And the result is, is that you get sent back a web page and other files, like the images and so on. But we're going to focus on the web page itself, not those extra files. The web page itself consists of HTML, CSS, and maybe some JavaScript. All right? And JavaScript, what is JavaScript? Again, when you hear the word script, think programming. So JavaScript is a kind of programming. All right? Programs are instructions of how to do something. They're not the end result. All right? So uh, a server-side script is the instructions on creating a, service, uh, a web page for a user. It's not a completed web page. And in this case, server-side scripting is used to alter an existing page. Whereas server-side scripting is generally used to create a new web page. 
Now again, keep in mind these are big generalizations, so you know, don't you, know, you could come up to me and you could find exceptions to this and so on, but speaking in very general terms, server-side code creates new web pages. Whereas client-side code takes a web page that's already there and alters it. All right. Now, how does it alter it? It alters it any number of ways. Let's look at the classic example that we looked at last time of using mouse over menus. And we'll eventually get to the point where we write a simple mouse over menu sort of thing. But if we go to any number of different sites, But if we go to ESPN.com, for example, I can check to see what the Browns did yesterday. Oh, they play. Ah, oh, see. Yeah, good news. Browns didn't lose uh, this uh, yesterday. All right. Notice what happens as I put my mouse over one of these menu selections. We can notice a couple things about it. First of all, it doesn't look like we're getting a brand new page. Most of the page stays the same. All right? In other words, it doesn't even blink like it's being refreshed. If you refresh a web page by clicking the little refresh button, the page blinks, right? It disappears and it reloads a new copy of the page. So you can see it being rewritten. Whereas when I put my mouse over these things, we don't see the page flickering and rewriting. This happens immediately. So that's the first clue that something different is going on here. The client isn't making a request to a server and getting back something. The client is doing this itself. All right. So there's instructions on the client side that allow you to show and hide the different menus. All right? Show and hide the different menus. So we're going to build up to this sort of example, but we're going to do it in stages so that we understand each step along the way. All right? Because actually the, the, the techniques used here are very similar to maybe techniques that you'd have in a photo gallery where you put your mouse over a thumbnail and you get the bigger picture, all right, for example. All right. So we're not making a new page. We're simply altering a page. So in this case, sort of the secret to this is in addition to what you see when this page first loads, you get a lot of HTML code that you don't see at first, that's made invisible. And then JavaScript simply changes it from visible to invisible. And then when you take your mouse off of it, it makes it invisible again. So that's it, really, it's really pretty simple. And again, it deals with altering a page that already exists and not creating a new page. So I'm going to write a, a page, we're going to write a page that um, would be like for a self-quiz, let's say on an online website. So we'll have a question and then we'll have an answer, but we'll have the answer hidden, all right, until the user presses a button that says they want to see the answer, all right? So we're going to do something similar to this and eventually we're going to evolve into doing this, but we're going to take it one step at a time, all right? And to do this, it's a combination of all three of these things. So this, I'm going to sketch out how our page is going to look. It's going to have a question, maybe like this. HTML stands for. All right. There's going to be a button that says show answer. And when you click the button, and I'll put a dashed line around this to indicate that it's, it's invisible at first and then it becomes, uh, it becomes visible when you click the answer. 
it'll say HTML means hypertext markup language. So when we first load the page, that's what we're going to see. We click the button, boom, that becomes visible. All right? In order for this to work, we need the three tools that you have on the client side to work together. What are the three tools, the three languages? They are HTML, there's CSS, and then there's JavaScript. So let's think about this in advance and see what, what tool is going to handle which part of this. All right? The actual content itself is going to be in HTML. So we're going to have a paragraph for this. We're going to have a button for this. And we're going to have a paragraph for that. That's going to be our HTML. You know, three things on this, on this page. All right? Because, again, remember from day one, we talked about HTML being the content of a web page. Well, that's the three pieces of content on this web page. All right? CSS will be used to control how this is going to look. So we might use fonts and different colors and so on and so forth. But the most critical thing about how this is going to look is that this, this part of the page originally is going to be invisible. So the fact that you can't see it is an aspect of the appearance of it. It's, it's, it's invisible. So that HTML is going to be there. We're just not able to see it. All right? And then the last piece of it, the interactivity, the changing of the web page. So that when we click on the button, we are able to see the answer is going to be handled through JavaScript. So JavaScript is, is, uh, handles the interactivity of the page. And what do I mean by interactivity? I mean that you do something, the user does something, and the page responds. It's exactly what we have here. You do something, put your mouse over a different item, and something changes on the page. So we're going to click a button, and then it's going to appear. All right. Now, JavaScript requires, for, J for this sort of JavaScript to work, and this, again, this is true in general terms, not true 100% of the time, but it's true in general terms. There's three elements that go into this sort of JavaScript working. Number one, typically there's a user action that starts the ball rolling, right? So, in the case of ESPN's page, the user action is putting a mouse over the menu item. In our case, the user action is going to be clicking on the button. But there's something the user does that gets the ball rolling. You know, that's the whole idea of interactivity. You do something, and the page answers you back. Does something back. Changes somehow. All right? And again, using JavaScript for interactivity is definitely one of the main uses of JavaScript using it for interactivity without having to load an entire new page. All right? Because we've had interactivity before, right? You click a link, you go to another page. That's a form of interactivity. But this is a form of interactivity without reloading a new page, while staying on the page that we're on, so that we get an immediate response, so we don't have to wait for the page to load up. All right? So there's going to be interactivity. And interactivity means a user does something, and the page responds. All right? So there's going to be some sort of user action, and we need to write code that says, hey, when the user does this, we want to do that. All right? So user action. Number two, we have to be able to point to different things on the page. All right. In other words, in this example, when we click this button, this paragraph gets shown. So we have to make sure that we're pointing at the right thing, right? 
that, hey, this is the paragraph we want to show. Imagine, for example, if there was a quiz, there might be, instead of just one question on it, a self-quiz, there might be 15 questions on it. Well, we have to say, well, when I click this button to show the answer, this is the answer I want to see. All right? Not some question that comes later on down the line. So we have to be able to point to the thing on the page that we want to change. All right? And the method to do this is done through what is called the DOM, D-O-M, which stands for Document Object Model. The Document Object Model is a way of pointing to different things on the page, in a nutshell. It's a way to referencing the elements of your web page. How do you think we're going to point to this paragraph, and this paragraph specifically, and this paragraph only? What have we, we've pointed to different places on our page before, right? How have we done that? How have we pointed to something on the page? Like, let's say with an internal link. When you click on something on the top of the page, it scrolls down to the bottom of the page. Do I hear an answer? Okay, that's okay. It's Monday. I missed, what I, I missed part of what I said, too. So we'll rewind for a second. The question is, is, how do you point to something on the page? For example, back in week one or two when we did internal links, so that when you click on a link, you jump to a specific spot in the page. We had to point to that spot in the page to say, we're going there. How did we do that? With a pound sign. Very good. And what does a pound sign correspond to? So we would say, for example, um, a href equals pound sign section one, like this. What did this correspond to? An ID, exactly. An ID is how you can point to something on a page. So we're going to use IDs for this too, right? There's other ways to point to something. Like, let's say I wanted to, say I wanted to point to you, all right? I could say, well, student number 674823 right? And assuming that was your student number, you'd know I was talking about you. I could also say the student that's in the third row in the center of the row. And you know, I, so there's, there can be a couple of different ways to point to something on the page. But if I really absolutely wanted to be sure with no ambiguity, I could, like, I, or I could say, you know, the student with the, the blue or black sweatshirt on, all right? And I don't know. I, I can't tell uh, if, if anyone else is wearing that. I'm not, not good with colors. But anyhow, uh, you get the idea. There's many ways you can point to something. But a surefire way to point to something is to use the ID. So if I had a list of student IDs, I could call out the ID, and you'd know I was talking about you. Same thing on a web page. All right? Remember, IDs are supposed to be unique. And what does unique mean? Unique means that there's only one of a particular value on the page, right? So for this to work, a href equals section one, there better only be one thing on the page that has an ID of section one. Otherwise, it might not work the way that I would expect it to. So getting back to JavaScript in general, a user action gets the ball rolling. We're going to point to different things on the page. And then we're going to access and manipulate the properties of the page. All right. So in this case, this guy's going to start out as being invisible and we're going to make it visible. So we're going to access and manipulate the way that we made it invisible, 
We're going to make it no longer invisible. We're going to make it visible. All right? Now, what properties are we going to access and manipulate? It's kind of like the joke about the 800-pound gorilla. Whatever we want. All right? So we, will, we can change anything about a web page. We can make it so that if you click on a button, the page changes color. Now, is that useful? I don't know. Not necessarily, but we could do it. Or we could make it so that when you click on a page, something that used to be invisible becomes visible. Well, we've seen cases where that's useful. So, yeah, that's something pretty good. All right. Or we could click it so that when you click on a button, it performs a calculation. Maybe we have a text box for um, temperature in Fahrenheit, and when we click on the button, it converts it to centigrade. All right? So we could do that in client-side scripting. It's going to take the value that's in the text box, do some math on it, and display it somewhere on the page. Change the, play, the page to include the new result. All right, so let's go and let's create a web page that shows our single answer and our single question with a single answer. And we'll add some JavaScript to make it interactive. All right. So, doc type. By the way, one one advice, and again, I'm I'm not saying that people in this class are doing it, but I have seen examples of it. Not everyone, but a few. Run your page through the validator when you're done. Let it let the validator tell you if you've gotten all your HTML correct. I've seen people that have had, you know, form tags in their head section and all different kinds of things. So be very aware that, you know, just because it doesn't break your code, there are potential problems if you violate the rules of HTML. So make sure your HTML follows the rules. So do what we talked about in the one class and, and um, run it through the validator. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to create my HTML page. And for, we're going to build this one piece at a time. First, I'm going to do the HTML itself. And we're going to do it all in one document. But again, you can have separate files for the different things. You could have a separate file for the CSS, and you could actually have a separate file for the JavaScript as well. So what is the HTML responsible? The actual content of the page. We're going to use an input control that's just a plain old button. Now, we haven't seen buttons before. We've seen submit buttons. But when you have a plain old button, that means that you're going to be writing the JavaScript code to do something when this button gets clicked. All right? I know I'm going to have to point to this answer to make it visible, so I'm going to give it an ID right from the start. And I'm going to give it an ID of ANS1.
All right. So here's my HTML and only my HTML. Again, I wanted to be sure that we're going to do this a step at a time. We're going to get each piece down. So I'm going to save this on the desktop and call it JavaScript example. All right, so I view this in my browser. And what do I see? Well, I see the HTML, plain and simple. What does HTML stand for? Show answer, hypertext markup language. Now, this isn't the way we want it to look, right? But remember, keyword is look. This is the content of the page. HTML is responsible for the content of the page. What is responsible for the way the page looks? That is CSS. So the next thing we need to do is we need to make CSS. All right? So this you could actually do two different ways. There might even be more ways than that. I'm going to put the CSS code right in here, but again, it could be in its own file. Pound sign, ANS1. And I could either say um, visibility hidden, or I, could just say, or I could say display none. What's the difference between the two? Visibility hidden literally just makes it invisible, but it still takes up as much space as it would otherwise. So you'll see like a, a big old empty block there. If I say display none, it won't display at all. So do I want that space to be taken up um, by the content even when you can't see it? Or do I want there to be no space taken up by the content I don't see? That's the two choices. I'll go add a second question here to show what I mean. All right, so I can say visibility hidden. Notice there's a little gap between them. That's where, that's where that other contents. Where that other content is showing. Uh, or, or would be showing. The other thing I could do is I could say display none. And if I do that, the what does CSS stand for will pop up a little bit. All right. So that's the difference between making it invisible or saying there's no display. And either one of them might be right. You know, I, it just depends on how you want to code the particular page, how you want the particular page to look. All right? I'm going to make visibility hidden. Because I don't want the rest of the stuff to move around when I show the answer. I just want the rest of the stuff just to be there. OK. And I'm going to do that for answer one and answer two. All right. 
So both of these now show, and the answer is hidden. All right. I'll make it a little bigger. All right. Now I can click that button all I want, nothing happens. Why? Because unlike a submit button, a plain old button doesn't have any default behavior. You can click on it all day and nothing is going to happen. You have to write some JavaScript to handle clicking on the button. All right. So, what's our formula for writing JavaScript? User action. Point to something on the page, then we're going to access and manipulate the properties. So, what user action triggers the ball going? All right. Well, clicking on the button does. So the way that we define what the user action is, is that we're interested in is through a, a list of what are called on uh, uh, or events. And events, you can tell an event because it starts with the word on. All right. So on click equals, and I'm just going to put two quotes in there for now, and we'll fill that in in a minute. All right. On click means this is what I want to do when you click on the button. All right. So when the button's clicked, I want to do this. And this is going to be a JavaScript statement or statements. All right. So that's what on click means. What events are there? There's a whole bunch of events. And they all start with the word on. On click is one. On click is one again. On load and unload. You can do something when the user first goes to the page, or you can do something when the user leaves a page. On change, when the user types something into a text box, we can do something. On mouse over and on mouse out. So we're not talking about the user clicking, but we're talking about the user putting their mouse over a certain portion of the page, just like we saw on the ESPN site. On mouse down, on mouse up, and on click event. All right. There's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of events. Um, for basic JavaScript, typically it's going to be um, the click event, on mouse over, and on mouse out. You can also, um, when someone presses a key, do something. Um, how many of you are Twitter users? All right, at least a couple people. Um, it's been ages since I used Twitter, but if I remember correctly, it shows you a countdown of how many characters you have left. So as you're typing, um, you know, you get 140 characters, so as you're typing hello, H-E-L-L-O, -L -L it would show that your character count, you have 135 left. All right? That happens every time you press a key. So there's JavaScript that fires off, that looks to see, hey, they pressed the a key, they change what's in that input box, and therefore, go and look to see how many characters they typed and recalculate how many characters they have left. All right, pretty basic, but still neat functionality for an application like that. All right, so on click on click is the event that we're interested in. On click is what's going to get the ball rolling. Now we need to point to this. Because when we click on the button, what do we want to do? We want to make this paragraph visible. And we already determined that the ID is our hook, right? Our ID is what we're going to use to reference that. And again, just like in real life where I could reference people a whole bunch of different ways, 
All right, I could use your name, ID number, the kind of headwear you're wearing today or whatever. All right. I could reference this a few different ways, but the easiest way to reference it is via the ID. So that's what we're going to use most often. That should sort of be your plan A. All right, I'm going to use the ID, unless there's some reason I can't use the ID. Now, here's a statement here that is the workhorse of the DOM. And the screen isn't showing very well, and I want to make sure that we get this. So I'm going to go and write it on the board. And hopefully we'll be able to see it better that way. That way. What that says is document, get element by ID. That's going to be sort of one of our workhorses. That's going to be what we're going to use all the time. What that is saying is that's telling the browser that's executing this JavaScript to look at the thing that has whatever ID you put within those quotation marks. So if I want to refer to if I want to refer to oops, this paragraph here, I'm going to type, type in document get element by ID ANS1. Now, warning. JavaScript is case sensitive, all right? Which means it matters if you make the letters capital or small. So in this case, notice get element by ID, the G is small. The E is capital, the B is capital, the I is capital. All right? The first letter of the first word is not capital. Every successive word, the first letter of the word is capital. The D in document is lowercase, and so on. Now, this is the expression to point to the thing on the page that has an ID of whatever ID we say. Remember we talked, I think even last week, about how forgiving HTML was. That if you don't do something exactly right, eh, it doesn't blow up the page. It, it kind of ignores it. Well, JavaScript is the opposite. You have to get things right, otherwise it's gonna, not going to know what to do. So it doesn't like take a shot. If it can't figure out what to do, it doesn't do anything. So we pointed to that. All right, so that's sort of part two of our list. All right, we have our event, which is on, click. We're pointing to the right element of the page. Document, get element uh, by ID, answer one. Now the last thing we have to do is we have to access and manipulate the properties. What properties are we accessing and manipulating? We're manipulating the properties of either the HTML or the CSS. So what made this invisible in the first place? What code made this invisible in the first place? The CSS code. We set the visibility property to hidden. So what's going to make it visible? Well, we're going to change it to something else. We're going to change the visibility property from hidden to visible. So how do we refer to the property? Well, in most cases, if it's a style property, 
We start with the word style. And then we type in the name of the property. Visibility. So what this does is this says, find the thing on the page that has an ID of ANS1. We're going to change its style. What about the style are we going to change? We're going to change its visibility. All right. What are we going to change it to? We're going to change it to visible. One thing you'll notice is that whenever there are things in quotes in a JavaScript statement, it's not part of the command. It is what's called a literal. In other words, it's literally what we want to, ch what, what we want to use here. What's the ID? Literally, the ID is the letters ANS1. What do we want to change the visibility to? We literally want to change it to the letters V-I-S-I-B-L-E which stands for visible. Notice I use single quotes here. You have two kinds of quotes. The double quotes are going to go around the whole JavaScript instruction. The single quotes are going to go on with, go, go inside the JavaScript instruction. So I'm going to copy this statement that I have right here, and I'm going to put it as part of my on-click event. So, I now have on my on click event document get element by ID ANS1. Find a thing on the page that has the ID ANS1. What about that thing on the page? I want to do something with its style. Well, what about the style? Well, I want to do something with the visibility of it. Whoops. With the visibility of it. What about the visibility of it? I want to set it to visible. And then every statement in JavaScript ends with a semicolon. So I can save this. And if I refresh this, my JavaScript should work. How do you suppose we could hide it again? What happens if we click this again? Well, it makes it visible, but it's already visible, so no big deal. Make another button to, to hide it again, absolutely. You, you could do it both ways. You're absolutely correct. You could do it either with one button or with, a, with another button. Um, you could make another button that did the exact opposite more or less the exact opposite. Point it to the same paragraph, change the visibility, change the style, change the visibility, except change it to hidden, so we could set it back to hidden. Or we could write a more involved JavaScript uh, um, command that would look at, look at it. If it was visible, it would make it invisible. If it was invisible, it would make it visible. All right. Uh, we're not going to do that one today. We'll probably do that next time. All right. It's not, it's not really that hard, but this is just our first day with JavaScript, so I'm going to try to keep it uh, more straightforward. So I'm going to go and copy this button. I'm going to change the text to say hide button. Document get element by ID, answer one, style visibility. Instead of making it visible, make it hidden. So we could show answer, we could hide the answer. All right, what do you suppose we need to do? If I were to copy and paste this code down here,
what do I need this to be changed? How do I need to change this to get this working for question two? Exactly. We're doing the same thing. We just want to point to a different paragraph on the page. How do you point to something on the page, a paragraph or anything? You point to it by saying document get element by ID and then put the ID in. So if this points to answer one, if we change that to ANS2, that will point to answer two. So now, show answer, hide answer, show answer, hide answer. Now to be sure, there's more things that we could do with the styling to make this look like a nicer page, but I just wanted to focus on the elements, um, the, the main elements of this. Notice again how each of the three languages that we've talked about this term have come into play. All right, HTML for the content. All our content on the page is represented via HTML. All right, so the answer, the buttons, or the question rather, the buttons, the answer, in both cases, are in the HTML. How do, we get the way, how do we get it to look the way that we want to initially? All right, we do that via CSS. We go and we hide the two answers. All right. Finally, how do we make it change based on a user action, user activity, without reloading the whole page? We do that by writing JavaScript. And that JavaScript points to the thing on the page, and or a user event triggers it. We point to the thing on the page, and we go and access and manipulate the attributes. One question. I have a style rule up here for ANS1, ANS2. If this was a 100 question quiz, let's say, that could get a little messy. ANS1, ANS2, ANS3. How could I simplify the CSS a little bit? Give them a class, right? Remember, the difference between a class and ID is only one thing on a page can have a, uh, a given class. Many things on, the, I'm sorry, only one thing on a page can have a given ID. Many things on a page can have the same class. So I could make a class of answer and then I could on each of these give them a class of answer. And it'll work the same. They're hidden, show answer shows it. So you'll actually see this a lot, where things have a class and an ID. The ID is there when you want to do something to it and only it. The class is there so it can be part of a group and it can be handled um, as part of a group. This bothers me because I'm being inconsistent. I'm going to go and move this answer. So it's below the buttons. Oops. Of course, I obviously didn't do that right. All right. Now, to be sure, um, JavaScript gets a lot more complicated than this. Like one of the things we'll look at next time is how could we do this with just one button? All right. Um, that would make the user interface a little cleaner, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's not that hard to do it with one button, but it's a little more than I want to tackle today, especially given that the class has ended. 
So we'll wrap up here, and we'll see you up in lab.